how are you doing? How, how was your Thanksgiving? <laughs> good question. It was, it was good. It was, uh, the travel was like killing me a little. I was just telling, I go to, I went to Indianapolis where my dad lives, where I grew up. And the only flight now from San Francisco to Indianapolis is a red eye, which is preposterous because it's a four and a half hour flight. So like you are not basically the flight is you are going to go 48 hours without sleeping or <laughs> yeah. however long, like you're going to go a long amount of time without sleeping. If you recall, the listeners have been to Indianapolis before. Oh, right. I have recorded from my dad's basement. That's before. right. So. <laughs> not said my dad's now in a different house, but oh, so record. yes. Okay. Yeah. But how how about you? Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. We had a totally normal, uneventful Thanksgiving. We ate <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I would love it if everyone showed up silently and just ate. And right. Up. Like no discussion. I didn't think about it at the time, but like it's just the last Thanksgiving we're going to have here in Baltimore, actually. So mm. um, a little sad in retrospect, but you know. I'm sure you'll have a good time in your new home yes right yeah we were just talking about coffee before we hit the record button and uh, we had a little bit of follow-up on our uh, patreon actually oh excellent a couple episodes ago so not the last one but the one before i think um we talked about you know coffee <laughs> as we often do and uh we i think we we often get not often. We sometimes get email or messages uh, along the lines of people being kind of skeptical that like you know, you can that anyone could really taste the difference in coffee. Mm. I think I you know what? I will I will say that if you add a lot of sugar, I kind of agree. Well, okay. So then this and so this person, I can I forgive me cuz I can't remember who it was, <laughs> uh, but suggested that we do some sort of experiment. Oh, yeah. So we can definitely do an experiment. Well, I don't know about definitely. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, but I thought it would be useful to design such an experiment <laughs> and to think Just about. Just a blind taste test. Yeah. Well, I, I thought it'd be useful to think about like how you would design it if you were going to do it. I would be. So you have to first. Sorry, I'm just jumping in before you're even. Jump done. in. Okay. I, I think first you need to define what the range of coffee making options are right right so we have to figure out like what are the factors yeah what are our interventions here <laughs> yeah so uh, what we discussed previously on the podcast uh was clearly was the grinder for example mm -hmm. right so the grinder is a factor potentially uh another obvious one is the coffee itself yeah uh, like the beans for example mm -hmm. um and then Another one could be the maker, like the coffee maker. Um, I don't actually think that's as interesting, but you could throw it in the mix. I mean, there's the coffee making method, but that's like a whole different. Oh, I think I lumped those two together, but okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's like, is it pour over? Is there AeroPress? Is it Americano? So yeah, I think you might want to just like standardize on one method. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I, yeah, you can only, all these variables we're talking about, at most, I would recommend like two that you vary. Yeah. Otherwise, the combinations grow exponentially. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. um, so we've got grinder, we've got coffee, we've got, is there anything else? What do, is there anything that, that in particular that we discussed? I can't remember now. Um, no, but there would be things like brew temperature. Oh, grind, yeah. Si ground size. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's way the acidity of the water. I actually do control that for my coffee. Do you make your own water? I do actually. Do you, do you which one do you use? I have a um something that adjust a little machine that adjusts the pH of my Oh, water. yeah. Okay, I remember this. Yeah. Yeah, I got into it a couple of years ago. I cuz I I realized that the like Evian water, for example, is um is alkaline, and I really like Evian water and the way it kind of hits your palate compared to like other bottled water. Um, and so I figured out that it was the alkalineness, <laughs> the basicness, if you will, I don't know, of the water. So I bought there's like little machines that 
like convert it to you can control the acidity and i did confirm it like i bought the little ph drops and like saw that the ph was in fact adjusted between right. the different methods yeah. and um so i fill my water boil- boiler i try to only drink the alkaline again I know there's all sorts of like, oh, you can adjust your blood pH, which I think is not true. This is purely for taste. <laughs> like I'm not I'm not buying into everything else. But no, I've I've seen like there are these like packets of minerals that you can buy and, and then you just put it in like distilled water. Um, yeah, I don't like that as much. This has like a electro whatever that like so like you turn it on, it attaches to your kitchen faucet, and then like there's a stream of water that's like discarded and then the stream of water that comes out that's like basic. So I don't, I don't really know. Actually, now that I think about that, Oh no, no, that is how it works. Cause there's a tube, there are two tubes, one going in and one coming out. So, yeah. So I think like if you just did grinder and coffee and let's say you had two for each. So that's just like a two by two experiment, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's not a particularly large design. Uh, and if you could say, okay, you could do th- Three fact one maybe like one would just be like making espresso and the other one would be maybe making like I don't know like a filter coffee or something like yeah that, like right? a pour over versus my nine barista espresso or something yeah. right so then that's like a two to the three design it's only eight experiments mm-hmm. right but I think another thing that you'd have to consider is when you're tasting the coffee how much can you do that before your brain you like, explode <laughs> yeah or like I mean not both from a caffeine point but also from like it's this is hard to measure because it's so subjective about like how's it tasting. So you you have to imagine there's like a a time series effect or whatever. You know what I mean? Like the order you do it in might matter. Yeah. So you would need to like do a like triplicates or something. Where well, you, you need like replicates, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that you are like doing it in random order that's different than the other random order to see if it like <laughs> to see if it works or not. So. Yeah, and I think also be- just because there are like variations, like even if you use the same grinder, like there are some variations and like from from like grind to grind. Um, so you need some replication there. Also, I think with like a blade grinder, I think that's very hard to reproduce. Yeah, because it's like some people like shake it and stuff. Yeah, or like how long you're grinding it. Like I don't know, you have to like control how long you're grinding it for. And that would be interesting to be like, is it the same? can you observe the variation again it's so subjective like you couldn't ask people to say maybe the measurement would be some sort of no that's too hard like a ranking of like favorite to least favorite oh yeah okay so just to be clear this is a good question so like what is the outcome that you're measuring yeah (laughs) yeah yeah. because is it like good versus bad or is it a scale of one to five or is it a ranked list of like favorite to least favorite that one would be too hard i think yeah i mean i think the primary question is like, can you tell the difference between any of these things? And so I, I don't exactly know how you would track that outcome. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Maybe they'll, yeah. I mean, I, now I'm going back on experiment design because I actually think then if that's the outcome, then you want the experiment just to be one variable and the person's predicting which. So the question isn't which do you like better? It's like, can you tell? which ones were blade grinder versus which ones were burr grinder. Well, yeah, but then you'd have to like use the same coffee every time. Yeah, exactly. So then you could go and do a coffee one of like, and then that's also an effect size thing of like, are we talking like Dunkin' Donuts beans versus blue bottle? Or are we talking like blue bottle? versus? Well, virtual? that's why there's multiple factors, right? Yeah. So like that's, so you can do it all at once, but I think if you just had the same person doing, drinking all this coffee, like there could be a time effect. Um, yeah. Yeah. That you don't... No, now I'm going back. I don't think you should do the like factorial design, if you will, with like three different things you're varying. Okay. I think we should just do one and just have the person predicting, can you tell? It's like the Coke versus Pepsi. But then the question is like, which coffee do you choose? Just like whatever my favorite one is. Okay. You don't think that matters? Mm, I see what you're saying. Is there an interaction effect? Between the coffee and the grinder. (laughs) Okay. That, okay. I'm back to factorial. (laughs) But I think it should be controlled for like, okay, you have like a high... Uh, high quality bean, mid quality bean, and low quality bean, right? Yeah, and okay. You can just do that. You can even do it with known. It's like, okay, I drink blue bottle all the time. So it's like, okay, 
I already have a familiarity there. So then it's a question of, can I tell the difference between essentially the way I prepare it versus a different way of preparing it? And then for like Starbucks beans or something, which I find like extremely bitter, then that would be interesting of like for something I'm not familiar with, that's like quote unquote lower quality. Can I tell the difference? Or like, if you're my dad, like Kirkland brand, Costco mega pack, like five weeks into the opening the beans, like, can you tell the difference between those beans? Yeah. Yeah. That So that's like a way, that's like a dosage, right? Like dosage experiment or whatever. A dose response? Yeah, dose response. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think the practical implementation of this experiment is actually more of a challenge, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like how much coffee are you drinking? I mean, you wouldn't drink like whole cups of coffee. Like you take a sip, basically. Yeah, yeah. A tasty little tiny mugs. Like you have to obviously have a second person so it's blind, right? And then it's funny because when you do perfume and stuff, the way that they clear your palate is with coffee beans. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. need something else to like clear your palate between tastes so that you're not having like the after effects of the coffee. Maybe some milk or something that's like makes the acidity go away. Yeah, I don't know what they use to cleanse your coffee palate. Yeah, and then, but you would figure that out. Sometimes yeah. I, use, I think I've seen like like carbonated water. I can see that. Yeah, people do that after espresso. Yeah. So if I you, know. I think at Blue Bottle, if you order espresso to stay, they give you a little shot of carbonated water. <laughs> Those are like two things I don't like: like straight espresso and carbonated water. Not into it. My expectation would be that the coffee itself is the biggest effect. Oh, for sure. I I cannot. I I can tell the difference between the bean because even like high quality beans, they just literally taste different. Like yeah, something that that, that introduces though another factor, which is the roast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and oh, so God. anyway, but I think the grinder is is noticeable, but second, at, or at best, second. I'd say. I don't think you can reliably get it like effect size. I mean, I guess you could. This is, I mean, these are really hard with experiment. Like the best version would be you put like a brain connection. <laughs> like yeah. you do some sort of brain imaging while the person is tasting. And then you actually see like how much the like pleasure sensors are going off or whatever. Like, <laughs> well, sensors. I don't think that's quite so simple as you think it yeah. is. But <laughs> no, uh, I think it's hard. Yeah. But it's doable. Like, so you would literally be in like an MRI, an fMRI machine, like tasting coffee but i mean i don't know it'd be interesting like i'm sure some like rich nerd is like maybe i can do this like <laughs> i mean i think if you ask people to rank it on a scale of like one to three or maybe one to five and uh, you know whether they like it or not but we've talked about this it's like this is where neuroscience is really hard because you're asking people to rate their subjective experience and it's fundamentally unobservable and you have like essentially an unreliable narrator of that experience right yeah because like if you're anything like probably everyone listening to this podcast you're kind of a head case so you might be like overthinking it and you're like oh let me think does this taste like how my coffee tastes like i don't want to mess up this experiment like let me say this like so that's why the brain imaging is you know pro i think that would be like extremely more reliable than asking someone uh-huh I don't all right. know. Well, that's like they can do that with wine, right? There's all this like wine taste tests of like, can you tell the difference if you know it's expensive or not? Like, right? Yeah, but that's a totally different quality and expensiveness are not necessarily related. No, yeah. Well, you could put that into the mix, I suppose, but um, it's uh, not something that I. Would, I mean, coffee only gets so expensive for the most part. Yeah. So whereas wine can be like out of control. <laughs> I basically, I mean, I, it's funny because in my head now, I'm just like, oh, I don't trust any survey responses, <laughs> which is, <isn't, laughs> I can hear Frauka being like, oh, no. But I, I mean, I do, but something like this is like probably one of the least reliable. If it's a ranking of is it A versus B, I trust that more versus like rate this on a scale of one to five. Do you like it or not? Okay. All right. Because I think do you like it or not introduces too much of someone's like head case. Yeah. Whereas ranking is a little bit more straightforward. Yeah, exactly. Or no, no, no. Sorry. 
A versus B. Yeah. So rank. I mean, not ranking, but like, oh, this is Burr Grinder. This is Blade Grinder. Oh, I and see. And that's okay. such an easier outcome to test. All right. Well. No one will ever do this, but it is interesting. <laughs> I'm sure. I feel like there's got to be some. There's like the people this. who put on the world barista competition or something. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I think probably this has been done in the past, but I think there have been a lot of changes just in recent time. Yeah. Here's a question. Should you be able to see the coffee or should it be like you have literally a blindfold on? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. You think there's a. I would say blindfold personally. Yeah. Because I think if you see like crema or not, you know what I mean? Like there's little like quality or if you see like grounds at the bottom when you're done with the sip, I think that's not, I think it introduces more <laughs> head case. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> okay. All right. All yeah. Right. Cause actually the grounds at the bottom are exactly what you would. I don't think you would ever get to the bottom because like you're not drinking that much coffee, right? Yeah. But that's just, well, no, but if it's like a little thimble of coffee or something, you know what I mean? Oh, like, okay. I, yeah. Okay. So that would just be something to consider is that the, like, cause visual definitely impacts your experience of coffee quite a bit. So sure. And like aroma. So you would have to also. No, I think you got to keep the aroma, right? Yeah, but you would just have to have it. You can't have them all lined up next to each other. Like you have to have the person in like another room or something <laughs> like with a blindfold. I feel like they would have to be made made to order, right? Yeah. Because uh, they're just sitting I around. No, yeah. Then they, they get cold, right? Yeah. But that's like. Well, there's other, you could have them all in like an oven or something. I don't know. Or all of them in like, have them all in uh, uh, ember mugs. Well, I think what you want is to simulate like how you would normally drink it. I think how you would normally drink it is like you make it and then you drink it, right? I just think, I think you might, would you let the person go back and forth to be like, "Mm, I thought that one was Blade, but now this one's worse. So let me go back and re-rank. Well, this is a good question, right? This is part of the implementation, right? That's like probably not, but that's why you would need replicates. Well, also, I think that's why you got to limit the size of the design space, right? Because if you have like, you know, I don't know what we're up to now, but it's I think it's pretty high. <laughs> would you, number... Here's another question. Could I for could I have coffee earlier in the day? Like, could yeah. you could you essentially like anchor yourself in okay this is what my coffee I know how I prepare this this is what my coffee tastes like well now we're talking about like um inclusion criteria right yeah, <laughs> this is not experimental yeah. design this is more <laughs> criteria well yeah. but it, no it could be experimental design because it's like I do think that anchoring is interesting like well it could be but it's not like we're not gonna I guess we could vary it right it could be part of the design but I don't know how interested I am in. Here's a question. Yeah. If you started off the experiment by telling someone, okay, here is blade grind. Here's a cup that's blade grind. Taste it. Here's a cup that's burr grind. Taste it. Now you're going to predict for these blind samples, which is which. Okay. So it's like, it's not like, hey, are you, do you have a sophisticated palate? It's not that. It's just literally like, if there's a taste difference here, we want you to first mentally map what it is and then is it distinct enough that you can predict it even when you don't know the label well i I don't think that really answers the question that's at hand here though um well no i think that gets at like is this a placebo effect you know what i mean it's like okay you already say you can tell the difference so like let's remind you what that difference is now, is that something that you just made up in your head as like a post hoc justification or whatever you call that? Oh, okay. So th- that is a different question. So I, I, my, I was thinking that like the question was like, can the average person tell the difference? Yeah. No. Right. But this that's is not, not what you're no, asking. No, this is like, no. Yeah. My question is, can someone like us who like acts like we're coffee snobs, who claims to be able to tell the difference, is that actually true? Okay, yeah, that makes more sense. Because yeah. then the average Joe would be convinced, the average Joe, the average Jane, I don't know, we don't want to complete <laughs> cup of Joe. But it's like, will the average person be convinced like, oh, if I develop my palate, then I could tell this difference. Right, okay. Yeah, I think that's the interesting question. Like this person is essentially asking, should I even care? 
Like, are you guys just, am I just listening to people who've like post hoc justified? What's that called when you justify after the fact? Oh, like uh, post hoc rationalization or something. Yeah, I don't, know I don't think that's... it's post hoc. Is there a word for that? I feel like there is. Maybe I'm making that up, but I feel like it's like this is like a skeptics. This is the very like well actually <laughs> experiment where it's like some skeptics like you're making this up. This is all in your head. And it's like, OK, well, let's set up an experiment where I prove to you that I can actually taste these differences. Right. Yeah. I uh, seems, seems like the most interesting comparison would be for grinders, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Because I cl- personally, I claim that that's like the biggest I think that could be a close call, though. I think, like, I think less interesting would be the coffee because I think that is easily discerned. That's a little bit more easily discerned. I think it would be really impossible to distinguish. I guess if you had somehow the same beans prepared different ways, because like coffee beans taste different, so it's not just like a quality measure. It's also like flavor measure. Yeah, right. And so, like, yeah, I don't, yeah. So, like, I don't know if that's an interesting comparison. Like, if you just take two beans that taste different, mm-hmm. like, because of vastly different, like, I don't know how interesting that comparison is, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, so, this is, so this is going back to actually being a good, an interesting problem because people always ask, what should I start with? And so, this would be a way of, what do you say? I say grinder. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, it's like, okay, let's actually prove that, like, that's more, experts can predict that better than like water acidity yeah i i think the first thing i would say is get good coffee right yeah i don't i don't i don't you don't say, say that, that. Yeah. oh yeah see, interesting that's why this is the interesting question uh, yeah i would not say number one get a better grinder like that would be number two on my list for sure i think i say that because someone trey causey who's like disappeared from twitter but used to be out all the time he told me that he i trusted his coffee get up and he told me that was number one. Okay. So he disappeared from Twitter. Yeah, he left. He must be. He must be so happy right now. I know he's so much <laughs> happier. I think he's on LinkedIn. I feel like I saw him on LinkedIn and like LinkedIn. Crazy. That's where all the action is now. Yeah, it is. Honestly, it is where I like kind of want to go. So I don't know. I do. You want to hear something I didn't do an experiment on, which I should have. Let's hear it. I did so I I finally sold my first batch of R mugs which was very exciting and I did not set up analytics on the website. I was just like I don't care. But, but now I kind of am curious like did this come from Twitter or I posted the same message on Twitter. Well, not quite the same, but similar messages on Twitter, LinkedIn and Post News. Okay. Which is this new social network I'm experimenting with. And I think all the referrals came from Twitter, but no, I know one came from LinkedIn because the person caught, like, I can see the name on the order and that person commented like, oh, yay. You know what I mean? So, okay. uh, anyway, so that's an experiment I should have run, but I didn't. A more traditional web experiment of like marketing channels, basically. So you've, you've, you posted all these bugs, right? Yeah, I made a website for them, and I posted the website. And, they and the website them. is notsostandardmugs.com. Yeah, I felt proud of that. I had to make, I decided to do a standalone website, like, kind of at the last minute. So I was like, what should I call this? And I was like, well, actually, this is Now, if you're listening to this, don't go to the website, because there's nothing there right now. Yeah, it's blank. <laughs> because the mug know, sold out in, like, an hour. The, I know, yeah, the mug sold out really fast, which was really gratifying, so... Thank you to everyone who bought them. So now you got to move to phase two of not so standard mugs, which is which is scaling, right? Scale. Well, okay, but here's the thing: I don't think that's actually. I think there's a degree of scaling you should do, but I think so. Here's here's how pottery works: is that I think we've talked about this before. It's it's a road to nowhere to be in the arts, basically, because once you If the only way you plan to make money is by scaling, then you will get your design ripped off by one of the bigger, like, people eventually. There's a threshold, right? Yeah, like, Urban Outfitters and Anthropology, literally, the way that their designers work is that they go to Etsy and stuff, they find popular things, and then they, like, mass produce those, like, direct ripoffs, not even trying to act like it's not. And so with pottery, it's the same thing where it's like you make a cute design, it gets popular, and then people start to rip it off and make it for cheaper and like scale it more. So 
the way that a lot of potters work, and this is the way I'll operate almost surely, is that they just do, it's like more of a personality thing where it's like, oh, it's not that I want any R mug. It's that I want one made from Hillary and signed by Hillary. And like, this is part of this community I'm in. And like, it's a fun thing. And like, you know, if you're someone who like imbues emotion and objects, which I definitely do, like there's an added value to like, oh, this person made this with care and they really care about it. And like, now I get it. And like, I care about it. And it's like, it's like a communication method, like a nonverbal communication between the artist and the buyer. And so point is the way that that is managed is like an Instagram presence or, you know, where you're like showing yourselves making the mugs and like, you know, like it's more about that, like the process. And then you do these limited drops and then everyone like rushes to get it from the limited drop. You know what I mean? Right. And so then it's not, then it's like boundaries where it's like, okay, I'm never going to be focused on scaling this. And it remains like a hobby, like, like a very, to be clear, this is not the road to riches for anyone. What? <laughs> it's not the number of, I'm getting paid pennies on the hour for these months. And it's not really about making money. It's more like a fun hobby. You know, it's like, it's like a fun, it is like a way of connecting with the community and like, having fun and letting other people have fun too and you know so point is scale i mean i want to like scale a little bit and the way i make the mugs is like the scaling way of making pottery where it's a slip cast mm -hmm. rather than be like hand making the r's every time it does seem i mean making physical products is just like it's a brutal <laughs> It is. That's yeah. a brutal business, I think, in general. It's never, yeah, you're getting paid for your labor, which is like what everyone in tech is trying not to do, you know? It's, it seems like once, you have, like, if you get to the point where everyone's copying you, then, like, the only thing that you can survive on, essentially, is your brand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exa yeah, that's a simpler way of being, like, it's like a personality thing. It's a brand thing. Yeah, because people, you gotta, you know, you, because, like, if your bug is being copied by everybody, then the only, you gotta convince people to go with your brand, right? It's like ketchup, right? Yeah, there are quality things, which again is like a brand thing of like, I mean, A, I actually don't think it would be easy to productionize these mugs because the handle is really finicky. Like it's not easy. I was like, okay, I get why anthropology isn't selling mugs that are like, oh, it's your initial as the handle because it's actually <laughs> like pretty hard to do that, you know? Yeah. And so um, it's just intricate, you know, and like it could break in a bunch of different places and it's so point is uh i can't remember what i was saying oh quality so it's like if if they were gonna if urban outfitters was like we really need to get into this niche programming language like mug game uh-huh they would take they would have to take shortcuts in order to productionize it because it's just a very like manual process so far and it wouldn't be as good you're saying it wouldn't be as good yeah so there's also quality, but I think I think what the modern era has taught it us is that most people would rather have cheaper, less quality. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I had someone contact me about like there's a lot of white label pottery where it's like you have a production partner, but you still sell it under your brand. So uh -huh. I could do that, um, but I kind of don't want to though because this is supposed to be like a fun hobby. This isn't like me trying to make money. This is like a fun hobby, and. And I'll, oh, the other thing I was going to say in terms of like scaling, quote unquote, or like, where does it go from here is that I actually, what I really want to do is start playing around with like the art of the mug. So it's like, oh, I can do designs. I can do different techniques, like surface design. Like, should I carve into it so that it has texture or should I use different clays or should I, you know, use color mason stains and make it more colorful or like tie dye looking or whatever. And so those things are fun for me because it gives me like if you're into pottery there's just a lot of objects that get created and you have to like do something with them uh -huh. and so if you want to like experiment having this to experiment with is like a way of experimenting without just like having your house completely full of different vases <laughs> so <laughs> well I look forward to the next drop, whatever that yeah. is. Yeah. Well, I, I this was the shot in the arm I need because I've had these mugs for a while and I kept being like, oh, I need to sell them. So I'm excited. And then I want to do stuff with like giveaways and charity and stuff because 
it, the thing that sucks is that the I priced them low because it was my first batch, but like again, like I'm probably putting I don't know like an hour of work into each mug, <laughs> so like and that doesn't even account for materials and shipping. So it's like forty bucks for a mug is like not you know I'm I'm paying myself a low price. <laughs> <laughs> I was calling it like a lose lose because most people that probably seems like a high price, but for a handmade mug. It could be like I I have a Potter I really well we've talked about him actually I have a love hate relationship with this Potter but he has really high quality stuff and like technically he's like a big inspiration for me and um, his mugs are like a hundred dollars each you know mm-hmm. but he makes money from like again the like kind of cult of personality or brand like he has all over his website like these are all personally made by Kurt and like thought you know it's like. He he puts a lot about like I touch this mug like this is not just any mug like, <laughs> I made it because he has shop assistant so it's like I'm like what do the assistants do like are they just managing like all the technical stuff like oh I have the clay prepped or whatever or are they doing some of the manual labor and then he is like you know slightly polishing or so you know like how how is it that this is kurt doing this you know we'll find well i think um as you uh what's what am i what am i trying to say as you kind of get more into this maybe the uh time to take do you think the time could be reduced yeah for sure and i already did some things like i bought a label printer for the address label that's like man if you want to make online shopping easier <laughs> Like, I cannot emphasize enough how nice it is to just have a sticker printout that you, like, slap on a box versus having to tape it. Like, it's like, I use, like, 12 pieces of tape getting a label onto it. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? Like, totally. it just saves so much time. And, um, like, there's other things like that. Like, I could get more efficient with. Um, so, maybe I, I should say if that if you're listening to this and you actually bought one of these mugs, like, let us know. Oh, yeah, yeah. When you get I, it. I am, like, kind of dreading if someone gets it and, like, I hate this. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that seems happen, unlikely. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that See, that's the other thing about being an ob- – like, if you don't have people on your side – like, you see this in Etsy reviews where people get really mad about – like if you're going for scale, then people start to get mad that they're not I like that they're not factory made, basically. Uh... They're like, why aren't these identical? Which again, factory, what does that mean? It's just a bunch of people like like there's not a lot of like like you have to touch pottery a lot, even in like a factory setting. So like there are people just sitting there like churning out like plaster molds and stuff. So but it's, it's, I think to me, it's a little bit like a restaurant. Like, how do they make all the steaks like the same? It's cause, it's because they throw out the ones that don't look yeah. right, you know? Oh and yeah, so... there's a lot of waste in pottery. Like people don't. I mean, that's why I sold. So that was a choice. A lot of potters would not sell like seconds and samples, um, where it's like, like I had some come out with a little speck on it. And like, I had prototypes I had made that ended up not like you have one, like prototypes that didn't go anywhere essentially. Um, or like they had flaws. And so I sold those for like 10 or $20, like, just like, okay, I don't want to like throw this in the trash. I'd rather like, if there are people there who $40 seems like steep, then they can get one of these for cheaper and it's like a cool story about like oh i was trying a different mold and you know so it's like you can still participate but some potters wouldn't do that they would just throw all that out so i feel like in some ways i don't know if this is true i'm not a good businessman so like just take this with a grain of salt but like the the those could be like more valuable because they're genuinely unique right yeah totally yeah i mean one of them it's just that like like the one i sent you some of them aren't usable so it's right. like how That's much true. is it important to actually like have coffee prepared <laughs> however you want like how important is it for you to like use it that way like i sent one that had a bunch of like you call it crazing where there's like little cracks yes and then that's my that's pencil actually... holder right now yeah and it oh no that one's just cracked oh, that... <laughs> <laughs> crazing is like only little cracks in the glaze oh yeah that one's usable i think right that's the uh, well it's technically not food safe although uh, okay i don't it's one of those things where you're like is this just a technicality and like <laughs> can you actually trace illness to like oh they had bacteria from the craze like I did I use know. it though, just so you know. 
but the cra- oh the crap didn't i send you one and then it like fell apart that one that one's it. my pencil holder okay yeah <laughs> it's like the crack like deepens it didn't fall apart it. but like i'm afraid to touch it now <laughs> yeah yeah that sounds about right i thought i also sent you a usable one yeah right? you did yeah okay. yeah there you go well enjoy have you been using it i have yes oh yay well, that's cool. I use it. It's not. It's like smaller than the ones than you that you sold on the website. So I use it mostly for like espresso. Oh, nice! Excellent. Yeah. Well, anyway. exciting. All right. Well, keep it up. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, I will. Again, pennies on the hour. This is my new get rich slowly scheme. Should we have like a like a giveaway a, or something? Well, maybe not a giveaway, but we can like maybe let the patrons the patrons know first. Oh yeah, I like that. Yeah. And then like. If they're not sold out <laughs> by then, a lot of people do that with like mail, like to incentivize like signing up for the mailing list or Patreon or whatever. It's like, oh, you'll get access, early access to like here's a special password for the website. So, all right, so let me just say this in completely explicit terms. So, based on the data that we have, yeah, the last time Hillary put dropped these mugs, they sold out in like what an hour and a half. Yeah, for the it was like. 20 mugs or something. it wasn't like a ton but yeah sure okay but you know that's the batch size right yeah that's the batch size right now so uh if you want to hear about the next one you know you can sign up for our patreon i have to figure out how to do that but i will figure it out <laughs> <laughs> well the, just that we're, we'll just notify them first that's all that's all it is yeah yeah um they'll get like a 30 second head start <laughs> the way i like it is if you have a password so it's like oh you can only access the shop with like the patreon password oh there. okay and that way people can't cheat i mean you can still cheat but it's like if someone just randomly went to the site and was like oh it's up like that's okay, true cool yeah. whereas like if you have the password then only the people yeah who showed up you know something that's funny is that they sold out but the tweet didn't get a lot of action if you will huh. so i did wonder if people like weren't retweeting it because they're like "Ooh, i want to buy this like they... <laughs> <laughs> like they saw it but like passively just kind of like like they clicked on it and but then like you don't want to share it because you're like "Ooh, i have special i found this i happen to find this like i also genuinely feel guilty because people are like i wanted to do the mailing list first but I just I was like, I just need to do this. Like, I can't. Well, you got to get it out there first. Or it's just yeah, see, I was yeah. like, I just need it. But I feel bad because people are like, oh, no, I didn't log into Twitter. And I'm like, yeah, I feel bad. Like, this is literally encouraging people to get on the hell site that is Twitter. <laughs> yeah, we don't so, want to do that, right? Yeah. So I'm like, I don't like that. I would like to get it on a different channel. So I think the mailing list is the most standard channel. So I'll probably do that. Yeah. All right. I have like a like quote unquote secret Instagram account and someone messaged me on there like, oh, like I missed it. I didn't actually even post that. I was I posted something about like selling out and it's just like my pottery friends. But then someone was like, oh, no, I missed it. And I was like, oh, are you like an R person who happened to find my account or what? You know, because I don't have my name on it or anything. I feel like you're not supposed to say publicly that you have these because then people can find you, but whatever. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Secret accounts? Yeah. Like, I, I don't necessarily want, like, my, like, posts about pottery to be part of my personal brand. Although, whatever. Maybe I should, but... <laughs> it's part of this podcast, so... Yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Well, I make other stuff. I think that's why I didn't want to. I was like, oh, I have, like, other stuff I make. Or, like, I don't know. Yeah. So, you want, can, can I tell you about something that I, I did recently? Sure. I don't know if this is going to be interesting, but I decided that. So one of the things I see on Twitter all the time, well, not just on Twitter, everywhere really, <laughs> mm-hmm. is uh, how you, how the value of kind of like college education. Oh, it, you know, that's so interesting. I was just, yeah, continue. Yes. So I decided I would try to figure out like how useful my college education was. <laughs> I, okay. But it, okay. it's. It's got to be critical because your job is related to your degree. Uh, yes, that's true. But, you know, yeah. I took a lot of courses in college, right? Yeah. Okay. Continue. So, but to be honest, I couldn't really remember which ones I took. So, <laughs> um, so I actually pulled my child, my college transcript. I was going to say, I would, I'd be like, I don't know. And then I go to like my records that I still have. Because I'm ridiculous. How'd you get the college transcript? Did you go to the Yale? I just I just went to the college website and they're like and like how because like people have to do this all the time. So like I'm like how do you order the transcript? It's eight bucks. 
Wow. And uh, I think it was eight dollars, like when I was in college. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they have it up the price. But yeah, but of course, like now it's way easier because you can do it all online. So, um, which you could not do when I graduated yeah. from college. So, so they make you pay, even though it's all like that's just a database query. That SQL query cost me eight dollars. That's ridiculous. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Anyway. Well, they had to create this PDF document. You know, there's like, you know, it's cost of materials. Yeah, it's probably manual. Like, yeah, it doesn't have to be manual, but it probably is. So I thought I, I was going to, uh, my hope was to write a blog post about this, but I thought I would just do this here. Yeah. Just to see kind of. So we can, I, I, my, so here's my, my premise. The premise of me doing this is that I think like, I've actually, I think I've actually used every course that I took in college at some point. Okay. Right. Yeah. Like everything I took, everything, every course I took was valuable. Okay. In in a in a non-trivial way. So. Continue. All right. You ready? Yeah. I should. This is. So I'll lead off with what I think was probably the least valuable course that I took, <laughs> which was elementary modern Chinese. Okay, that's weird though, because that seems like. Have you been to China? I have been to China. Right. Like I've been there a couple times. Yeah. And. Uh, my Chinese is not great. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. And most of what I know now was I actually learned, I would say, before college. Right. Like growing up. Yeah, growing up. Because right. your parents, like, I guess they must have spoken English in the home. Right? We didn't speak Chinese at home. Yeah. So yeah. it was mostly like Chinese school and that kind of stuff. So I did learn some in college, but mostly I've forgotten. Like the stuff you learn in college is like more formal. Um, and I think I've mostly forgotten it. But anyway, it's kind of like it has like it has usefulness kind of a priori but i'm not sure how useful it was right all right yeah. all right so things like multivariable calculus i still use that today that's no question mm -hmm. um gen advanced general physics <laughs> mm -hmm. i forgot i took this because i got a b minus in it but uh <laughs> it, that one did not come in handy until like very recently i would say yeah it's because Ever since my son kind of got interested in like rockets and rocketry, all of a sudden I like I had to relearn. I had to like use physics. Right. Oh, so, so like Newtonian physics. Yeah, yeah. So this is like first semester physics, which is all like mechanics. Um, second semester physics, which is electricity and magnetism, I dropped out of, so I never took that. Nice, good yeah. call. Uh, elementary. Uh, so this is a uh, elementary analysis and composition. So this is a music course. Mm. Um, this didn't come in handy <laughs> until like. <laughs> Five years, well, well, like five years ago, right? So, but it actually played a role in my statistics job, professor right. job. You, right, you did the talk, right? Right. I, I talked about like music theory and kind of like how that might relate to data analysis. And uh, so I was glad that I knew all that at that time. But but it laid dormant for like 20 years. <laughs> Does it help you like appreciate music though? Uh, in general, yeah, it does. Yeah. I would say. So, yeah. are you putting, are you assigning value to that, or no? I do sign a, assign a little value to that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, this all these measurements are like useless. Like, you don't have the counterfactual, right? Like, well, the question is, I, I guess, is the question a causal one? It should be, right? I mean, what, like, if you had not, well, I guess the question, which the which. Ca which other outcome are you learning about? Like, if you'd not taken the course or if you'd not gone to yeah. college at all? Well, you said, right? yeah, you said the value of your college education. So presumably it's like in aggregate if you hadn't gone to college. I think my point, though, is that like if I hadn't, if if you had asked me like five years after college, mm -hmm. I would not have said that elementary analysis and composition was really useful. <laughs> right. I mean, I took it because I like that stuff. But objectively, but that's a useful like like what when you say useful is this like capitalist like oh it's useful for my profession. That's one, yeah. That's one of those. Yeah, like I think if you use it, that's why I feel like like Chinese is the least useful because I don't really use it at all. Yeah, but like if, if you like are enlightened enough to value your life on more than just your productivity. No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking yeah, about yeah, like yeah. general value. Yeah. Okay. Right? So uh -huh. I'm talking about like kind of like uh, what's the word? Just cold usefulness. Yeah. Right? <laughs> this is. I mean, I I disagree with the premise, but I'll continue. You disagree well, with? Uh, with... I, I disagree with your capitalist mentality. Well. But that's what people are talking about when they complain about it on Twitter, right? Yeah. Well, not the liberal arts people. They're like... They don't complain, though. 
yeah that's true yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're like you're like oh let's like answer like let's play along with these capitalists is what you're saying yes that is, that is what i'm saying yeah and um and i think now that i'm like almost 25 years out of college is a good time to review right like, i think a bad time to review is like one year after you graduate you know right. yeah yeah <laughs> But I think, like, I think you're, like, wait, hold on a second. My cat, like, really wants to get on my lap. <laughs> okay. She's been, I've been gone, so she's, like, extra needy right now. It's very cute. Um, okay. I, I disagree with the premise that you should even play along. You know what I mean? This is, like, a true liberal arts yes. response. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's fair enough. Yeah, like right. you're you're lending credence to a flawed worldview, and I think that's not good. I mean, I think the other counterfactual to think about is like whether you can just like learn this all on your own, right? Oh yeah, um, probably. And I, and I think yeah. like maybe not. It would have been a lot harder 25 years ago. Yeah, um, but today, music composition seems like that wouldn't be that hard to learn. Like, I feel like there's a lot of non-college resources for music composition. Well, for everything, though. Come on, let's be realistic, right? I mean, for yeah, almost yeah. everything, especially at the introductory level, right? Yeah. But, like, advanced physics is harder for, like, the layperson to find. Like, like you could just work with, the, like, a... Like, if you took, like... If you're in, like, the right choir or something, you might learn some of the music theory stuff, right? That's... I Now I feel bad. I feel like music theorists are, like... How dare you be this condescending about our field? That like, <laughs> no, I mean, I think like if, if I recall correctly, that course was like counterpoint and uh, and like kind of like harmonic theory, which is not like you learn some of that just by like doing performance, um, but you don't learn counterpoint. I like I didn't I never learned I never saw that. I don't that. even know what that is. Yeah, so. that's exactly yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. And I so. was like fairly involved with music, like in my fifth grade. Did I tell you about this? My fifth grade teacher had us write a letter to ourselves for 10 years or 11 years from when we wrote it. And then she actually tracked us down and mailed it. And I was like, this is like a charming idea. But honestly, I was especially knowing my class. I was like, this is probably depressing for like 80 percent of the people. <laughs> and mine was also like kind of depressing. But I was like, I was a music major at a small liberal arts school. <laughs> So I was at a smaller real large, but then the biggest one was just like, it was like, you're going to be married. You're going to have kids, all the, uh, like all this stuff. Yeah. And I was like, I can't believe this is my focus. And yeah. also like, sorry, Hillary, that's not what yeah. the situation is, but you're fine with it. But like, it's still depressing. <laughs> <laughs> or it's like, it's depressing to see that that was your mindset. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, I don't like this. Like whatever. Anyway. Well, I, I, I I'm like reacting to your, uh, your uh what's the word um my opposition. your dislike your yeah. dislike of the premise i should say yeah well continue okay i'll play along better so well the last one i wanted to mention is in my first year freshman year was uh i just took first year performance which is basically violin lessons um yeah and yeah. uh i'd say the performance stuff that has come yeah. in very handy. huge yeah. huge yeah because that's like giving talks and that's, stuff. Uh, that i do every day right teaching a class it's just the it's the same thing right so okay so that was first year, but also very easy to get outside. That's like probably the most easy. You don't need. You outside. definitely do not. Yeah, you definitely do not need to go to college to do yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, to do performances. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can take those kinds of classes pretty much anywhere. Um, all right. But you're like, in terms of the capitalist premise, like you are a bad capitalist with like, because you never thought you were going to be a professional musician. Uh, I did at some point. Oh, really? Okay. But probably by this point, no. Yeah. So you were like just having fun in college for some of it. Well, it's hard to say. The psychology of what I was thinking at the time is, I think, is complicated. Yeah, that's why you need the letter to yourself from like, <laughs> you know well, what I mean? Well, like, for example, like, why did I take physics? I don't know. I think I took physics because I thought like that's what I was supposed to do, you know? Yeah, yeah. I feel like half of my college can be described by... Hillary thinks she should always do the hardest thing possible. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like, what's the hardest major? Okay, I'll do that. Like, it, I think that's literally what happened. Yeah. So maybe that's why you took physics. Is what yeah. And then like, when I got to my second semester, I'm like, why am I still doing this? It, the, the answer was not clear. So then I dropped it. Yeah. This is though, in terms of me being so obsessive with like, like I just shipped back like six boxes of my college and high school notes and I'm sitting there, I'm spending like a whole day of my vacation at my dad's house, like 
packaging up priority mailboxes and like taking them. I was just like, I was like up super late the last night, like wrapping it up. And I was like, normal people don't do this. But the reason why is because I want these insights of like, oh, did I write notes to myself or like, like, it's so much better to have the raw data on like, what was I Especially, I think I mentioned I in, in middle school and stuff, I was in a religious school and high school. So they had you do a lot of journaling and stuff. So you could get into that mindset of like, why am I doing this? Like, I don't know. I, th- I found a really funny essay about like religion where I was like complaining about how boring the sermons were at the church I went to. <laughs> I don't know why that cracked me up. It was just like. I was like, oh, I should really go to church, but like, it's so boring. I can't do it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Yeah. Continue. Well, Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I think to me, it's like you can take advantage of the selection bias because, like, if you don't remember, then it's just like, well, I know you forgot. Yeah. Like, the mar- <laughs> in terms of this, like, what's the marginal gain of me knowing? I don't know, yeah. but I do like knowing. <laughs> I and I appreciate that. I don't have. I don't to- lack you know, total appreciation. Yeah. But like, for the most part, does that impact my life? Like maybe a little, I don't know. It does. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. One thing I was, so in my soft, okay. The last course for my freshman year is linear algebra. That's like, obviously I'd use that every day, but in my sophomore (laughs) year, one thing that I was wondering about, so I took intro to computer science Um, and like for the life of me, I couldn't remember why. Yeah. But I think it might've been like one of the like choices that you could take for the major. Because I majored in applied math, so. Um. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they, those departments used to be, like, my mom's department at DePauw was joint between math and computer science, and then they split apart. Yeah. Probably at the time that you were in college, so. Yeah. The other thing is, like, I had a number of friends who were, like, CS majors, and so maybe that's why it's, I, yeah. So maybe this is one of, the, I mean, I'm pretty sure I didn't take any notes, <laughs> so there's nothing to well, say. Well, I was going to say. Yeah, it's like, do you even remember what you learned in the class? Oh, I definitely remember what I learned. I don't know why I necessarily took them, but I definitely remember what I learned. Yeah. Um. So there, because there I learned scheme, which is like not something that's easily forgotten. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But it's like, I feel like some of the classes where you're like, I don't know if this is important. There might have been foundational stuff that you don't even remember that you learn there but now right. you use it all the time right well scheme is the basis for r right so that's uh i mean i didn't know Whoa. that at the time obviously so, yeah yeah i don't know i didn't know that i don't even know what scheme is honestly i was just laughing along but <laughs> it's just like a programming language that you only see in like intro to computer science classes yeah <laughs> it's okay. like you don't that's see it in the I'm... real world right yeah. um so but it is a cool language it's kind of like lisp okay um <laughs> How is R based on it? It has the same uh, semantics, right? So, oh. like underneath, so it doesn't look the same, but mm-hmm. underneath the hood, the way like the language is interpreted is this is very similar. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, probably the most influential course: data structures and programming techniques. Wow. Yeah. I can't believe that's awesome. Yeah. That was the weed out course for the CS major. I remember, um, and uh, I got a solid B in that course. <laughs> strong b yeah that would have been hard I <laughs> it was super hard holy cow yeah. yeah wow that's cool though i would have loved to have had that yeah that was a straight c programming course i, I don't even think they oh i can't imagine that they teach right. you in c anymore yeah um, but, less into it now yeah ordinary and partial differential equations you probably took this too right uh i don't think i did you didn't take differential I think equations I... I took differential equation, but I don't, maybe, okay, so maybe you're, yes, I probably took it then. I I got thrown by the name. Oh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I used this. I this might know. be the least useful one besides Chinese. I haven't drawn this symbol in a long time, so yeah. I, this is where I really should go back to the notes and be like, what did I even learn in that <laughs> class? Like, I don't know. Yeah. I literally could not tell you a thing about it. Yeah. Only the symbols like DX, <laughs> DT, or something like, right? No, is that just calculus? I don't even know. <laughs> I have no clue. <laughs> yeah. So my junior and senior years were less interesting because, like, then I just started t- taking statistics classes. And so it was, uh, those are obviously still useful. But then at the last class I took in my senior year, modern jazz theory, which that was a mm. super cool class. Yeah. Um, that's it. In terms of the non-capitalist, like just being able to appreciate jazz, I feel like you have to learn stuff. 
I don't know how many people go to jazz and are just like, I get it totally. Versus <laughs> like, I feel like you have to like learn about it to like appreciate. Well, there is that old saying, which is that like, if you, I mean, I don't know if exactly remember what it is, but you have to learn about it, then you'll never get it. You know? <laughs> like, oh wow! Like, yeah, yeah. I, can, I think okay. it was like Miles Davis who's like. You know, someone asked him what is jazz, and he's like, "If you have to ask, you'll, you'll never understand." Um, I get it, but also like, f you a little. But like, like <laughs> modern jazz, theory, modern jazz theory is like one of those things that you take, you kind of take it ironically, like you kind of know going in that like the reason I'm taking this is because I'm never going to be like a jazz musician, you know, <laughs> and this is the only way I can kind of appreciate it. <laughs> I, you know, I disagree with that. I guess that feels very like elitist. It, I mean, it is elitist, but it's like, I just, not like, <laughs> this is like a George is getting upset, but it's like for people like me who grew up so math and science focused, like it does like open your soul to like learn about this stuff. And like, it, like it takes training to get your brain working in different ways. Do you know what I mean? And so it's like, oh, okay. If you're like, if you grew up with artistic parents and you grew up and you have that like natural, like inclination that like, that feels, it it feels very art snobby to be like, you can't learn it because I think. Oh, no, I just don't think this is the kind of thing you learn in a classroom. Um, I don't, but I disagree because I think like, I guess I feel like I've learned a lot of art as a scientist, you know what I, so like I have to take that kind of educational approach, but then when I do it, like unlocks a door and I'm like, Oh, okay. Like I want someone watching over like mentoring me, if nothing else to be like, Oh, can you think this way about it? Like, or you're getting caught on this, like try it this way. You see what I mean? Like, I think, I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm having an earnest reaction to this. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, you, if you were looking at like classical compositions, like most classical composers are like cl- trained in music theory, like took it in the classroom, you know, all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff, like just like I did. Um, yeah. I would not say the same is necessarily true of all jazz musicians. Oh, definitely um, not. And so, but it's like it's like saying that because they didn't learn it that way, you shouldn't. And no, I no, I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying that's not what's done, right? Um, and I think, uh, but, but I do think that what's interesting about like, like something like jazz theory, uh, as in addition to classical theory, is that it's mostly just like it's not like a it's not like a natural theory like you have in physics, right? Like it's mostly just like this is a summary of what has been done in the past, right? Um, and so it's like when you look at different categories of jazz, it's like this is the general patterns that occur, and you know, and it's just like it's just like summary, uh, you know, it's just descriptive, I guess, is for the most part. Um, and so it's. Um, so, which I think is like has some overlap with things like when you know that we when we teach data analysis, you know, it's like well, you know, there's no like overarching theory of like this will produce the good data analysis or not, right? And so it's uh, it's a little bit more like that. So I think that's the... oh right. So you're still going back to like the capitalist, like did this help me be a statistician? Well, I think it helped me think about different styles of theory, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And like, I mean, if you're this is again the liberal arts, but like if you believe that like we're fully integrated humans who use all of our different ways of knowing for everything then like i I feel like i lost my own train of thought but like then it's helpful you know then all all these things matter right yeah yeah exactly and like like if you believe that like there is i think the data analysis this is like the theme of the podcast to some degree is that like the art and design of data right and so, of course, taking art class is helpful. But yeah, but yeah, and I think the question is like, how how are they helpful? And they're kind of like different, you know, types of courses, different types of training are helpful in different ways, I think. Um, and I think, um, so like, I think performance, for example, is helpful in one way, but like music theory is like, that's a different type of helpfulness, I think. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. I just can't get over that. Like, <sighs> I just feel like that it's like this that that like Miles Davis quote is the same as people being like, oh, you're just bad at math. Like you're never going to be good at math. Right. Right. Yeah. It's it's basically the same. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so not helpful because like as humans, we have all of the resources to learn these different things. Right. Right. And like even if you have like how you're raised and like, you know, whatever kind of biology affects like kind of your way of interacting with the world 
it's like it's like useful and like better for you to push yourself outside of those ruts uh, yeah and i think but that the, i think there is a distinction in tr- when it comes to like the maturity of a field right mm-hmm. yeah, uh sure. whether it, like so i think like i think data analysis is, is a good example actually like most people would say you don't learn data analysis in the classroom right like you'd learn it by doing it right right and um and I, I think that's one of the things that maybe we're trying to challenge a little bit, but it does come down to the maturity of like the field of data analysis, which is not very mature, I think, right? I don't think that's totally true though. Cause I do think part of it is this, like it's a design field and you just have to teach design differently. And it is more of the apprenticeship model. Well, I... cause you're teaching composition. Although I guess you just said you took your composition classes. Well, the, you know, I think so something like composition, like classical composition is like, you know, it's hundreds of years old, right? Yeah. And yeah. so there are a lot of things that you just like learn that are like basic, that are like fundamental principles, right? And mm-hmm. yes, you break them, but yeah. you learn them first, right? And I think, you know, if you look at jazz in the middle of the 20th century, um, like, I don't know, like how mature of a theoretical foundation it had, right? And so I could see someone saying like, well, I don't know what, I, I don't know what this is. Like, I just do it. Right. And so how can, like, I, I can't even explain it to you because I don't even know what it is. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think as, as like an area matures, like you can say, okay, you can propose like a jazz theory course because we know more now. Right. Um, and so, I, I mean, yes, I guess it is like, it's definitely a snobby like thing to say. Um, but if someone were to expl- ask me, like, how do you do data analysis? I, I, I like, it's not like I'd have an answer just like ready to go, right? Yeah, no, I agree with that, but there's different ways of saying that. For like, sure. you could just say, <laughs> yeah. like, I wish I could tell you, but I can't. Like, it's it's part of the nonverbal part of my brain, right? Right. And At least like, for now. Yeah, and so it's like, yeah, and it takes that, but that's where it's like, you know what? The people who don't get it are the ones who will end up defining it for like everyone else who doesn't get it. Right. Cause they have that beginner's mind and they're the ones that are mapping out like, okay, here's how, like everyone says like, Oh, the people in the intro classes who can like talk and like, they get where the students are coming from. That's cause they went through that struggle. So it's like, right. you know, super organized people are like, I don't even know how to tell you to get organized versus someone who was like very disorganized and had to learn it is like I wrote a book on it like here <laughs> right 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 yeah 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 so it's just like I don't know anyway yeah. I was, that the whole artist thing that that gets to me because it's I guess it's just like I feel like I have benefited so much from exploring that and like for the most part I only run into like very welcoming people but you do run into things like where yeah, it's just there's a there's a divide between the people who like again, it's like a nonverbal thing. So the people who haven't needed to build the pathway between the nonverbal part of the brain and the verbal part for this type of stuff. It's like there can be that frustrating gap there. Yeah. So Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know. All right. I didn't know I was so mad at Miles Davis, but <laughs> I, I know. That quote. Yeah. I don't know if it's so, I don't know if it's real. That's what I that's all I remember. <laughs> yeah, I'll look it up. I'm sure I should give him more credit, but you know. It reminds me of the design books we've read where they're like everyone acts like it's just this unknowable genius thing. But it's like, no, this is actually a discipline. You can strengthen it. It's but that's like a, a but mystery. that was a transition, right? Like that yeah, they, totally. you know, they had yeah. to kind of it's not like you know, they had to kind of like actively work on that, right? Yeah. And I really do think it's like the logic, like it is this, I need to like actually read neuroscience stuff about this right brain versus left brain. Because I do think like when we talk about that, it really is just building that connection between this like nonverbal experience and the verbal part that's like the most efficient way to communicate it. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm, Like mm -hmm. a lot of it is just about translating it to the right words. And that's actually hard because you usually have to build the vocabulary, define it in order to do that. And so, and that's like poetry. Like I, I feel like a lot of the best, especially with like Buddhist teaching and stuff. It's like, it's like the people, the way you get it across is almost via poetry where it's like, you just draw the right analogies and like that starts to click for people. You're like, Oh, it's kind of like this connection. And anyway. Yeah. 
yeah so i should actually learn about this finally because i talk about it all the time but it's like i don't really i don't understand it beyond like the couple neuroscience tidbits i picked up over time like (laughs) yeah anyway all right good episode